Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com runs down the major markets. The TSX hit a record high and the U.S. New York exchanges came back to life. He takes a look at gold, crude, and commodities. Longtime veteran of the B.C. brokerage business, Victor Adair, gives us his take on inflation, deflation, precious metals, the U.S. dollar, and the Canadian buck, and how they fit into his trading philosophy. Trends Journal publisher Gerald Salente checks in from historic Kingston, New York. He tells us the government isn't giving us the real inflation story, how real estate in the U.S. hasn't hit bubble territory yet, and where the next world flashpoints will be. He also tells us about a new religion. Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have a company showcase update from American Manganese President Larry Ray. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. You can find him on Twitter at Charts by Ross. Welcome back to This Week in Money. Good to be with you, Jim, and uh, a week with a little bit more volatility in it than we've been seeing for a while. The TSX, uh, has it hit the 2000 or the 20,000 mark, I should say? Yeah, uh, it has teased that level, uh, pretty much all week long and then on Friday managed to push through. You know, you got, uh, uh hit a pretty big hiccup early in the, in the midweek as far as some of the, uh, the commodities were concerned and, uh, with that, uh, the Canadian dollar or the Canadian market was having a little bit of trouble, but by Friday, uh, there was buoyancy across the board, and so we're through 20,000 for the first time in history. And uh, on the U.S. side, uh, the broad markets there, you know, we've been in a, probably a six to ten week consolidation phase, depending upon which of the broad indices you're looking at, whether it's the Dow, the S&P, or the NASDAQ. And uh, about two and a half, three weeks ago, we got these good oversold readings and have now uh, um, turning back and coming to life. So th this fits in very nicely with the, the seasonal, uh, which first year after a presidential election, um, when you've got an uptrend, the uh, the movement tends to take you into July, and as of now, um, looks as though we're more than just a, a selective rally with the um, energies, financials, and REITs. Uh, we're going to have more of a broad-based one uh, as we uh, move through the month of June here. So, uh, good should be good for most investors. Now, the U.S. stock market's uh, back to life after lagging Canada? Oh, yes, very much so. Um, you know, it's, uh, and, you know, everything needed a bit of a breather. Um, this is, uh, this is one of those stretches where, um, you should now start to see momentum, um, return on the upside. So, um, normally we would look at, uh, moving average support. Uh, and in this case, we're at the point now with, uh, I think the S&P would be a good index to work with uh, for um, the investors to monitor. The uh, the 20 day moving average, exponential moving average, should now provide us with good support as we move through June. And I think as you get uh, into July, it might start to look for it to uh, peak out and roll over. And once we've got that. Uh, then you would normally see uh, a correction back down into support as we get into August. So um, buoyancy probably for the next month, uh, and uh, then be careful once again because uh, you know as you uh, as you move through the summer, uh, you tend to have less 
uh, news that will move the market. You know, we've just finished going through an earnings season, or we're just at the tail end of it. Um, so it'll get a little quieter uh, as we get into the summer. And uh, markets, if they get ahead of themselves, then an August correction looks to be, or an correction into August will be the one that uh, we'll, uh, we'll have our eye on. What kind of action did we see with the precious metals in the U.S. dollar? Uh, midweek, uh, some pretty big action. The U.S. dollar had a, a really good rally from uh, Wednesday through Thursday. I mean, we're you're talking just, you know, day by day action here, but that was pretty big. Uh, and, uh, in the process, uh, the gold market, um, just took it on the nose, the 30 or $40 a day to the downside. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago, or I guess, no, May the 25th, uh, we put out a report showing that uh, we had uh, upside exhaustion readings on uh, on gold. Uh, we had uh, a sequential count that uh, was complete, and the odds were that we were going to see a top within three days and a correction down to the 20-day moving average. Well, all of that, uh, that top and break uh, occurred <laughs> very, very quickly um, by uh, by Thursday of this week. Um, that created an outside reversal week. So we had had a new 10-week high uh, at the beginning of the week. We took out the previous week's low on Thursday and came back for a pretty good recovery, rallied back over $20 on Friday. But overall, this market still looks a little tired in here, still could go through some more consolidation. The uh, The best support for gold would be down now around the 20-week moving average, around 18, 20 or so. And um, if we can get uh, a uh, correction into that level, I think one could start to look at uh, fairly aggressive long positions. But uh, for now, uh, this, uh, this consolidation phase that uh, gold seems to have uh, entered into, I think that could last a, a little bit longer. What's going on with crude? Uh, great move here in crude. Uh, we're just, uh, I think, a 69, 70, just short of $70. Um, and th- this fits in nicely with uh, what we've been looking at, that, that consolidation at the 8 to, uh, or sort of the uh, 10 to 11 month stretch after a bottom. That was, uh, and the, the low was April of last year when we had that inverted uh, number. We were down to negative prices in terms of oil. Um, since that recovery, um, you had the good rally. We had a consolidation, which is typical in that 10 to 12 month period after the bottom. And then you start, when you start to come to life as we, as we did a week and a half ago, this should carry us now into July, um, at the minimum and ideally would actually take you through into the fall, but at least July from a timing perspective. And uh, the oil stocks are just uh, on fire right now, in particular on the Canadian side, and um, outpacing uh, the oil itself. So uh, that's good to see. As long as we don't see any divergence uh, with the uh, the stocks underperforming the uh, the oil, uh, I think we can be in a, a pretty positive attitude for that sector. Commodities still on a tear. Uh, yeah, well, you know, we did have a, a pretty hard correction there in the grains. Um, corn, wheat, soybeans all had those good exhaustion highs about, uh, what was it, four or five weeks ago now. We corrected hard, uh, as we were anticipating, down to the 20-week moving average in corn and uh, uh, overlapped that as far as wheat was concerned. The f- so nice oversold readings. And when you've got a rising trend like this, I mean, this big bull market that's been going for the better part of a year now, um, we're at that stage when you look back historically where these either have one more great leg to the upside, and that would be uh, then taking us into July, August, which from a seasonal perspective is where you would expect to see um, corn, wheat, and beans put in their tops, and I think we've got six of these when we go back to, through to the 1970s. Um, the key was the recovery off the last correction, that correction that uh, bottomed out a week and a half ago. Once you've retraced uh, more than 60% of that correction, 
that um, corroborates the fact that the uptrend is still in motion, and now you can make that next uh, phase of the rally, which should take out the highs that we've already put in. Um, Percentage-wise, not have the same kind of a move that we had off the bottom uh, last year, uh, but um, a pretty good rally to take us into uh, into July, August. So um, for now, anybody who picked up that decent correction, uh, I think that uh, they can use that as their stop loss and just see how far the um, the grains want to run right here. Ross, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Always a pleasure, Jim. My guest has been Ross Clark from ChartsAndMarkets.com. You can find him on Twitter at Charts by Ross. Coming up, Victor Adair, next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlan, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Victor Adair. Recently retired from nearly 50 years of being in the brokerage business in B.C., his website, victoradair.ca. Welcome back to This Week in Money, Victor. Jim, uh, always good to be with you. Thank you. Victor, inflation reports have been surging lately. Some people say it's a temporary thing with supply shortages caused by COVID-related shutdowns followed by reopening demand. Other people are saying with all this money printing going on, currencies are losing their purchasing power. People want to own things rather than paper money. So inflation is here to stay. So is it a transitory thing, temporary, or is inflation going to be around for some time? Well, Jim, if I could give you a one-word answer, I'd say both. <laughs> Isn't that called stagflation? <laughs> no. Um, we have had uh, a kick-up in inflation reports lately. Certainly part of that is because, you know, a year ago, because we do these year-over-year comparisons, a year ago the economy was in the tank. There, there is that. There has definitely been some supply shortages, bottlenecks, whatever you want to call it, because a lot of producers of stuff kind of shut down during the COVID period, and now that they're reopening, you know, there's no inventory to be had. This is particularly sensitive, say, with uh, computer chips and, uh, and semiconductors, where you've got cars that are sort of built all but for the plug-ins that they have, and, and they, they just can't put those cars out there. So new cars are scarce, and people are bidding up the price of used cars to really, really sharply. Whatever. You know, there is inflation uh, now. And and when people, consumers, you know, they're not all economists, thank God. So people just see that prices are up and they begin to expect that prices will keep going up. And in a way, in a sort of a vicious circle way, uh, if people have inflation expectations, that in and of itself can create inflation because you think, Hey, you know, toilet paper prices are going to go up. Let's load up on toilet paper or, you know, let's put, make sure we get a full tank of gas all the time in the car, that kind of thing. So it creates that, that demand. I think one of the interesting things that would have to happen if we are going to see some sustained inflation rather than just temporary would be wages have to go up. And for the past, say, 20 years or so, capital has been rewarded, and wages have not, in a very general sense. Certainly part of that is, you know, we outsource jobs to low-wage countries around the world, and unions lost, you know, their their uh, negotiating power. Uh, we've had the rise of the gig economy. We're seeing in different places where employers are having to offer inducements, higher wages, benefits, and so on, to get people to come and work there. So if that is a sustaining thing, if wages you know increase and they get sticky, then yeah, we can have inflation carrying on as, as we as we go ahead. 
there, there's another thing happening here too, and that is, um, I think we're seeing a sea change in the way the public looks at government or what they expect from government. It seems, you know, that let's just say North America, that we are becoming more European or more socialist. We, that people are looking for government to solve this, solve that, and so on and so on. And government is taking on uh, more and more uh, fiscal policies. You know, they, they want to they want to spend more social infrastructure, whatever. So that's likely to be inflationary. Certainly with all the money printing, we talked about this on the show before, you know, the purchasing power of your dollar it is going down. You get less stuff for a buck than you used to, so why, you know, why save a dollar? Just spend it now. So I think on the, on the relatively short term, I think some of the, the play on what we call the reflation trade or the inflation trade where, you know, you buy things that are going to benefit from, from inflation, uh, it's probably overdone, but I would think a longer term over the next few years kind of thing, uh, we're going to have more inflation than what we've been used to in the past, say, 20, 30 years. And a big part of that, that deflation, or I shouldn't say deflation, the, the disinflation environment that we've been in that's kept inflation so low, a lot of it's due to the technological advances and that sort of thing. The old school play on inflation would be to sell bonds, buy gold, buy real estate. You know, in this new world that we're in, what are you going to do if you want to bet on inflation? I think what we're going to see is people want to, you know, take on more risk, use more leverage to buy assets and to, to get out of uh, holding currency or just holding cash in the bank where you're getting nothing for it. Stock markets had a massive rally from March last year to March this year. The S&P and Dow rallied nearly 100%, but over the last few weeks, they've been going sideways. In this kind of environment, are you a buyer or a seller? Uh, I, I, I've been kind of poking away at the short side in the stock market uh, for the past couple of months. Uh, I Honestly, I've made some money, lost some money. Uh, on balance, I've really gone nowhere, kind of like the stock market has. But just to put it in perspective, yes, we've, we've doubled the stock market from the low of uh, March last year, but we got into a pretty big hole. Uh, you know, the stock market had had a very strong, by the stock market, I mean the leading indices, had had a very strong 2019 and, and into early 2020. And uh, I think the S&P was up about 40% over, the, over a one-year period there. So when the virus hit, we really, you know, we, it hit an overbought market. We really fell into a hole. If we go back and say, where are we at relative to, you know, the highs of February, say, of 2020, the, the S&P is up about 25%. So we got into a big hole. That's what makes the rally from last March look so strong. Um and then again, as I mentioned earlier, we've got this big change in uh, in the stimulus. Instead of just looking to monetary policy, now we've got the governments involved printing money like crazy. We've got people talking about MMT, you know, that government deficits don't matter. You don't have to pay for all the spending that governments are going to do. Um, I think with, with interest rates so low, people uh, are reaching for yield. They're looking for anything you know, that they can make some money on. So we've had capital flows into stocks for that reason alone, as well as, you know, people love to buy things that are going up. Uh, where we're at short term uh, on the stock market, I think the market is vulnerable to a shock. Uh, but, you know, you say, where else is capital going to go? And we have uh, big programs of passive investing where you know, people get their paycheck clipped every week or whatever, and, and the money just goes into the stock market regardless of what the price is because they've been sold on the story that, you know, over time the stock market does nothing but go up and compared to other assets, you, you know, you need to be in stocks. I think sometimes, you know, what what are people buying here other than the hope that whatever it is they're buying just continues to go up? I mean, if you were to go out in the world and look at a private business somebody owns a widget factory of some kind 
and you look at his books and you say, okay, this is how much you've sold. Here's where you're at, you know, compared to your competitors and so on. Here's your profitability. Here's this and that. How much would you pay for that business? Well, this is kind of called value investing. And I will tell you, you would not pay nearly <laughs> the premiums that people are paying to buy the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones these days. So, you know, what are you expecting in terms of future performance? Some of the folks that are kind of of my persuasion will tell you that given the run-up we've had in stocks in the, since, say, 2009, uh, the expectation is you're not going to get a lot of return over the next 10 years. But anyway, maybe... Maybe I didn't quite get around to answering your question. Uh, I've been trading the stock market from the short side. Uh, I'm very careful about being short there because I think it's it's a powerful rally and it could easily go higher. Um, I certainly haven't moved my life savings into the stock market and got my fingers crossed, hoping that it'll keep going up. Uh, I think it's I think it's a trading market and I, I think it's uh, overbought short term. But you know, one more thing. There's been a lot of rotation in the market. Certainly the big winners last year were the high-cap uh, tech stocks. They are called a long-duration asset because a lot of their income stream is going to come from years and years out in the future. So if interest rates rise, they're particularly vulnerable. So some of the money is left, say, owning Apple and Google and that sort of thing and, and gone into more uh, value plays. So. I think it's yeah, it's, a, it's more of a stock pickers market in my view than than somebody who's just going to go out and buy the index and cross their fingers. In previous interviews, you frequently made the point markets are interrelated. That changes in the currency market, for example, impacts commodities, stocks, bonds. What correlations are you seeing happening right now? I think the the main correlation that I see across asset classes is uh, what I call a pro risk. Trade this this willingness to take on risk to use leverage, and what that means is you know you buy stocks, you buy commodities, you short the U.S. dollar. I think that's a very strong correlation across broad assets right now. Uh, as I said earlier, you know people like to buy things that are going up. You know whether it's baseball cards or real estate or crypto. Uh, certainly, we've seen some of the uh, the spec or retail favorites. You know, have uh, that had a huge run up. I mean, Tesla certainly comes to mind. Uh, you know, ran up to nine hundred dollars, fell back to six hundred dollars. Uh, that's that's a, a a pretty nasty correction. A lot of the stocks that were bought, uh, let's call it the the COVID stay at home stocks. You know, whether it was Zoom or Peloton, uh, you know, the exercise equipment, that sort of thing. Uh, a lot of those stay at home stocks you know, have had a, a sharp correction. Um, more specifically, uh, a great example of a correlation has been between uh, gold and the U.S. dollar. Uh, so far this year, there's been a very strong negative correlation there. What that means is, uh, for instance, the high for gold this year uh, was the low for the U.S. dollar and vice versa. So there's been a very strong negative correlation between gold and the U.S. dollar. Another correlation I really pay attention to is there's been a long-time favorite in, in the world, and this has been the, the correlation between stocks and bonds. It's been the basis for what we call the classic 60-40 portfolio. you got 60% of your assets in stock, 40% in bonds. The thinking is that the stock market gets in trouble, the bond market will bail you out. I think that that is probably not going to be such a, a good balance going forward because with bonds, uh, yields on bonds so low, uh, I don't know if there, there's much room there for them to bail you out if the stock market was to get hit. So, yeah, I always, always, always pay attention to correlation. You know, one of my favorites was Jimmy Rogers years ago said to me, Victor, how can you possibly trade wheat in Chicago if you don't know what the price of iron ore is in China? And, you know, that just kind of got my head spinning when you try to think about that. How much information can you take in and process? And then, of course, the irony is that once you see a correlation, you say, hey, every time X goes up, then Y does this. So, hey, X is going up. I need to do whatever with Y here. And, you know, that's the time the correlation breaks down. So 
I, I pay attention to them, and the main one right now, to come back to your question, is this pro-risk trade. Pro-risk means your long stocks, your long commodities, and short the U.S. dollar. And, of course, from a trading point of view, I think that if the pro-risk trade is overdone, then I want to be going the opposite on those three things. The U.S. dollar was at a nearly three-year low in January. You said the mob storming the U.S. Capitol building on January 6th was an infection point, and the dollar rallied about 5% into late March. However, since then, the dollar has fallen back close to the January low. So where do you think the U.S. dollar goes from here? Well, it's not monolithic, of course, but um, yeah, just to put the, let's look at it this way. At those lows in the beginning of January, it was January 6th when the mob went into the cap, U.S. Capitol building, uh, the U.S. dollar had been falling pretty steadily against most everything for about nine months. Uh, traders in the market were positioned very bearishly, the U.S. dollar. In other words, they were massively short, the U.S. dollar, and sentiment just across markets was also very bearish, the U.S. dollar. So then when the U.S. dollar didn't go any lower and started to lift, a lot of people are positioned the wrong way. They had to unwind. Market rallied for three months, I guess. The U.S. dollar rallied for three months. And the bearish positioning and bearish sentiment definitely became less. But it never got full-on positive bullish, the U.S. dollar. And then here the last two months as the dollars dropped off again, the bears have been increasing their bets and both positioning and, and, and in in uh, sentiment. When you look at the currencies, the euro is the is the significant anti-dollar position. Uh, and it, when the, in the world of trading, where you trade currency pairs, the euro U.S. dollar pair is by far and away. I think accounts for more than half of the world's total volume of, of all the currencies that happen. Europe had kind of lagged the, the, the U.S. Uh, a bit this year in terms of economically and also with their vaccination programs and so on, but then seemed to play a catch-up in just certainly the last month or so here. The European stock markets, for instance, have been outperforming the American ones. On the other side of the coin, the Japanese yen uh, has been weaker than the U.S. dollar this year. So then... I look at a trade like, what's the euro yen doing? What's the, you know, euro doing relative to the yen? Well, of course, you know, euro is like at a three and a half year high against the yen. So I could do a trade where I don't even need to involve the U.S. dollar. If I think that this euro yen trade at a three and a half year high is another example of what I call bullish enthusiasm in the market, I could go out and sell the euro by the yen and look for that, that trend to reverse. Uh, the uh, the Great British Pound has uh, gone uh, up year to date against the euro. Once we sort of got the Brexit uncertainties out of the way, uh, Britain's been a, a play. The stock market in the UK is also more global, maybe more a little more commodity oriented than continental Europe. That might have been a benefit. We're in Canada here. Everybody knows the Canadian dollar has gone up. I've referred to the Canadian dollar as the strongest currency in the world this year. The other commodity currencies, Australia, New Zealand, even Norway, and uh, others have all gone up against the U.S. dollar. So clearly, you could imagine, the Canadian dollar has gone up, you know, big against the Japanese yen. Even the South African rand uh, here, uh, I see, is at a two-and-a-half-year high. The Russian ruble, I, I don't trade it, but I pay attention to it, was at a multi-year low a year ago, and uh, it's come back in its near three-year highs against the U.S. dollar. So when I say the U.S. dollar is not monolithic, that's what I mean. There's all of these different things out there that you can trade uh, against the U.S. dollar. To get to the heart of your question, I'm kind of inclined to think the U.S. dollar, the positioning on it and that sort of thing is too bearish, and I'd be looking to see if the U.S. dollar doesn't find a, a bottom and start to rally, and then I'd want to be a buyer of it. At the moment, because I'm a little pessimistic on the bullish enthusiasm for commodities and stocks, I own out-of-the-money puts on both the Canadian dollar and the Australian dollar. Uh, the Canadian here is... Uh, the, the sentiment has been very, very bullish. I think it's a play on the commodity market. 
And uh, I think Canada at, at 83 cents. I mean, we were at 68 cents at the lows last year. We're now at 83 cents. I think it's, I think it's got ahead of itself. Uh, and it's also looking on the chart like it's a little bit toppy. But once again, as a trader, you know, I haven't, I certainly haven't backed up the truck. This is just a, a position that if it's not working, I'll kick it out. The Canadian dollar has been the strongest currency in the world this year, trading around 83 cents U.S. Do you think? It's still tracking gains in the commodity markets, or is there something special about the Canuck buck? Um, the main thing, three main things, okay, that are the other side of the Canadian dollar trade. One's the commodity market, the other's the stock market, and then the weak U.S. dollar, how the U.S. dollar is doing generally against, say, most of the European currencies, that sort of thing. And uh, commodities have been favorable for Canada. Uh, stocks have been favorable, and when I say stocks, I just notice that there's a, a a very short and longer term correlation between the Canadian dollar and the S and P 500. If the S and P 500 is ticking up, chances are the Canadian dollar is ticking up. And clearly, if the uh, all the other currencies in the world are rising against the U.S. dollar, or most of them, I should say, are rising against the U.S. dollar, Canada is probably rising as well. I've created long-term charts on my website a number of times to show the correlation, say, over the past 20 years between the Canadian dollar and the CRB, Commodity Research Bureau Commodity Index, and it, I mean, it fits like a glove. So I think there's spec positioning in the Canadian dollar, uh, has been very much a play uh, pro risk play, but it, with it with an accelerant, I guess, as a as a play on uh, the commodity market rising. The, and so we have, I mentioned earlier, you know, we've seen it rise from sixty eight to eighty three cents. The Canadian dollar from the lows of last year, March of last year, rose that much, and the trend was very steady, just kind of chugged along to the upside. The worst setback in that whole period of time was about two cents in October of last year. So it has been, I would call it a trend follower's delight uh, to be long of the Canadian dollar. Let's talk about gold. You previously told us that gold and the U.S. dollar have had a tight negative correlation this year. When the dollar was rising, gold was falling and vice versa. For the last two months, the dollar's been weak and gold has rallied about 200 bucks. Are you bullish or bearish on gold? Well, again, you know, it, it, both. <laughs> well, but, thank you very uh, much. Uh, <laughs> uh, the correlation's been very strong this year to date. Historically, that's a strong correlation. Weak U.S. dollar, gold does better in U.S. dollar terms. Uh, the other correlation, of course, is, is with interest rates, particularly uh, if real interest rates, that is, once you Take the nominal yield on the bonds, subtract out the inflation rate, and you get the real rate. In a, in a, in a, just a few words, uh, uh, if interest rates are really negative, that is, real interest rates are really negative, that's almost always a good environment for gold. So uh, we've got real interest rates are negative here, and that's been a boost for gold, and certainly the, the weak U.S. dollar has helped. Uh, you know, people let's say over 60 years of age are going to remember gold running from uh, about $200 to $850 in one year from January of 1979 to January of 1980 and uh, all of the all of the press that that got at that time but you know people that are 20 to 40 years old certainly don't remember that time and, and they're more inclined to buy crypto I think the crypto, there's been dollars flow into crypto that if crypto didn't exist, those dollars might have gone into gold. Uh, I know my friend Martin Mirenbiel has done some analytical studies on that and was able to quantify, uh, as economists can, uh, how much crypto costs gold. And, and it, it wasn't huge, but it, it was significant. There was a, a loss of, uh, of capital that might have done, you know, instead of going into crypto, might have gone into gold. Um, if you had bought gold, let's say back in 1982, uh, you, about $300 an ounce, it's now $1,800 an ounce, so you've got a 6x on, on gold. You know, it's gone up six times what you paid for it. 
But in 1982, you could buy the S&P 500 for 100 points, and it's now worth 4,200 points. So it's gone up 42x, and if you add dividends into there, it's about 80x. So, I mean, the S&P has hugely, hugely outperformed gold in the last 40 years. No question about it. Uh, so gold, take it the other way around, gold is really, really cheap relative to stocks and also to relative to real estate and bonds. So, you know, I think maybe, uh, you know, gold has got some real value and relative to other assets, you know, if you have a long-term view, you know, gold uh, looks like it looks like a bargain. Uh, but, you know, markets move, uh, at least certainly when they get really humming, markets move because speculators choose to be buying those markets, whether it's, you know, gold back in, 1979 or the dot com or real estate or lately baseball cards crypto um, and if 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 the speculators aren't interested in bidding up gold you know you're not going to get much price action maybe just to wrap that up you know when people think about gold it used to be thought of as insurance in your portfolio you know the the classic swiss pres- prescription was you want to have 5 to 10% of your total assets invested in gold to kind of balance your portfolio. Well, if that's the case, then you really don't care too much what the price of gold is. Actually, you kind of hope it doesn't take a rip to the upside because it it would probably mean that the rest of your portfolio is getting banged. Uh, So you, you want to think about why you're buying gold. Are you looking to speculate on a price increase or are you buying gold because it's a, a real asset and it's going to be a balance to the rest of your, uh, your the rest of your holdings? Right, and there's always that argument. If they're saying Bitcoin is the new gold, uh, but the thing is with Bitcoin, if we had one super solar flare, it could wipe out every computer memory bank. There goes your Bitcoin, your gold. If it's in a vault, we'll be perfectly safe. Are there any concerns about that? With gold, no matter what happens with the price, you'll still have some gold. Whereas if something's uh, purely an electronic asset, it could be wiped out in, in the blink of an eye. Yeah, it goes back to that the difference between a 30-year-old and a 60-year-old. You know, um, I have never traded crypto. I mean, I've got it on my machine here. We have a futures contract. Uh, I pay attention to it. I, I see it's fallen in half here the last couple of months. But it had a spectacular rally just before that. Um, I I have that same thought of you. I remember there was a Canadian firm where suddenly a hundred million dollars worth of Bitcoin just disappeared somehow, or somebody hacked into it. Um, you know, I, I have enough trouble trying to gather what I think is the right information and then process it and deal with it and then look at where the market is. You know, trying to speculate in markets that I've been trading for years and years, and I think I know something about them. Uh, for me to go out and speculate in something like baseball cards or, or, or crypto, I don't know anything about those markets. You know, I, I just assume that I'm going to lose my money. So, yeah, I, I, I hear that vulnerability to, to crypto. But, you know, beauty's in the eyes of the beholder, so the the 60-year-old guy buys gold and the the 30-year-old guy buys crypto. Interest rates hit historic lows last year. They've risen a bit since then, but are still very low. Some people say the big gains in real estate are due to ultra-low mortgage rates. Others are saying that interest rates can't rise because there's too much debt. If rates rise, the increasing debt service costs will kill the economy. What are your opinions on what's happening with interest rates? Well, you know, there's there's the way the world should be, you know, from your point of from a from a, my point of view, and then there's the way that the world is. Uh, I am disappointed that you know the bond market has been killed by the central banks. You know, it's not a it's not a price discovery market anymore. Um, Ultra low interest rates that we've had, let's say it's at least 12 years now since 09, 08, uh, have created a reach for yield mentality, uh, out in the world. Uh, people who should be saving their money, you know, putting their money in the bank and maybe getting themselves a, a rock solid five or six percent annual, 
uh, rate of interest, and maybe there's three percent, you know, inflation. So they're they're making two percent real rates. Uh, those people aren't aren't saving, or at least if there are saving, they're, they're they're saving because you know they're just scared to death that they don't know what's going on in the world. But these savers have been turned into traders, and uh, I think that's wrong. I, I that I understand why the central banks have done what they've done, uh, but to well, let's look at it another way. Let's say folks with uh, that have long-term liabilities. Let's call them pension funds. I mean, they like to own long-term assets to match against those liabilities. Uh, with 10-year nominal yields at 1.6 percent or so, um, I, I don't see where those folks are, are going to continue to buy bonds, uh, other than to flip them out. I mean, it, with negative interest rates in the in in uh, Europe uh, at at a nominal level, let alone a real level. Uh, you buy bonds so you can sell them to the central bank. They're, they they are the bid. So, you know, I think the the market's been corrupted. And sorry if I'm on a bit of a hobby horse here, but it's it's just so it is. Now, in, let's talk about how it is. So, given that, he, okay, Victor, you, you think the market's been corrupted, but what do you want to do with it? Um, you know, I think those folks like. The pension funds, we've seen that the trend over the past number of years as interest rates have gone down and down, that they look increasingly to alternative assets to, uh, to try to make up for what they can't earn in the bond market. Uh, I think that, as I said earlier, that bonds aren't much of a hedge anymore for anybody who's got a 60-40 portfolio mix. Uh, so what's going to happen to bonds? I mean, the, the center, people say the, the, Central banks can't ma- manipulate the long end of the market. Well, they certainly can. They have. Uh, short term, I guess, if the stock market was to take a tumble, the bond market would probably get a bid. Okay, I think there's that. So that's that's a short term trade. Uh, but for somebody who says, you know, I'm going to go out and buy myself a bond uh, with a 15 year life on it, it's got a two percent yield or something. Uh, nominal yield, which means over the next 15 years, I'm guaranteed to, to lose money. Uh, I just don't see that there's going to be much of a habit to, to, to do that. But the manipulation uh, by the central banks is just not going to go away. Uh, so where does it leave us? You know, I think bonds are a short-term trading instrument, which is sad to say, but that's what I think the, the reality is rather than what I think how, how things ought to be. WTI crude came close to hitting $70 this week. That's a doubling since November. Will we see $100 crude this year? You know, short uh, short answer to that, I, I don't think so. But, I mean, I've been amazed at the run-up we've had. I mean, you know, it was just over a year ago we had briefly uh, crude oil trade at negative prices because there was so much of it around and no place to put it. Uh, yeah, we were 34, 35 bucks in November. Um, you know, the, I think the key thing there was the vaccine came along. The Pfizer vaccine was announced a, a day or something after uh, the election in the United States that, you know, ultimately it was decided that Joe Biden won the election. Uh, the, I'm going to call it the, the, the uh, vaccine, um, the vaccine really made the difference. It, it gave the market that enthusiasm to think, okay, this this really nasty problem we've had with the COVID, what it's done with the lockdowns and so on, it's going to be it's going to be history once this vaccine gets distributed around enough people and the usage of uh crude oil is going to increase. Uh, I think we got uh, prior to the the attack of, of COVID on the economy. I think we were doing about 100 million barrels a day of demand and supply. Uh, I think that dropped down to around 75 at the at the deepest point, and now we're back to about about okay 95 million barrels a day. So we're we're still five percent or more below the levels we were at in terms of consumption back in 2019 uh the esg movement you know they've had a couple of uh major wins here the past two weeks or so uh going forward generally speaking very generally the esg movement is going to crimp um capex uh for 
companies going out to find more oil or develop, you know, pipelines to, to get oil moved around. So it, that probably means uh, there, there's some scarcity effects. So, you know, that's maybe a long-term bullish uh, view on the price of oil. That vac- vaccine optimism um, on the reopening has, has doubled the price. I think a lot of the run-up here in price has been speculative buying, just like there's been speculative buying in the stocks and commodities and speculative selling in, uh, of the U.S. dollar. I think, again, this is that correlation across assets. But put it this way, you know, if, if the price of crude oil jumped 10 bucks between now and a week from now, would that shrink demand? Would that act as a discipline on demand? You know, I, I don't think so. Uh, so I, I think that would, it, it would just, you know, it's not, if we, if we jumped a hundred dollars a barrel, okay, demand would crater. But ten bucks isn't gonna, isn't gonna hurt. So if I look at crude oil, and I do, the price over the last 20 years or so, let's say the average price has probably been around 60 or $70. So like gold, uh, WTI is really cheap compared to some other assets like bonds or stocks. Uh, or So the marginal demand, I think, going forward is going to come from, and by going, this is obviously over several years, is going to come from emerging and developing markets, you know, that developed markets like the United States, Europe, Canada, and that, uh, are trying to get away from using fossil fuels. So you talk about Africa or India or that sort of thing, maybe that, or China, that's where the, the, the demand is going to come from. So short term, to come back to your question, I don't see $100 a barrel oil this year unless we have some geopolitical shock that causes people to freak out and, and think there's, you know, they got to grab whatever oil they can before there's none to be had, and that, that makes prices jump. Victor, thank you so much for chatting with us. Jimmy, it's always fun. Uh, appreciate it, and, um, you know, we kind of a, a, a bit of a ramble here, but my, my general thinking is that we've had a lot of speculation in the market. It showed up in a really goosing the prices of a lot of commodities, a lot of stocks, driven the U.S. dollar down. I'm inclined to think that maybe that speculation has run a little far, and I'd be looking for things that might trigger a reversal in that pro-risk attitude that that, uh, I see out there. My guest has been Victor Adair, a recently retired person who's been on the brokerage business in B.C. for various firms, but also a co-founder of the Polar Futures Group. That's something to brag about, isn't it, Victor? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, uh, I had a a wonderful career in the uh, brokerage business for 44 years, and um, uh, I'm I'm semi-retired these days. His website, victoradair.ca. Coming up, Gerald Salente, next on This Week in Money. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Gerald Salente, publisher of the Trends Journal, available online at TrendsJournal.com. He's speaking to us from historic Kingston, New York. Gerald, it's great to have you back on This Week in Money. Great being on. Gerald, can you tell us what's the latest in the Trends Journal? Oh. <laughs> you mean of the 140 pages weekly? <laughs> Well, you know the the, um, the the big news is inflation on the economic front. You know this we've been saying this is going to happen now for several months, and it's real. I mean, you're looking at um, you know copper prices had recently hit an all-time high. Tin, steel, name the commodity, and um, you're looking at oil. I mean, Brent crude now is what's over seventy dollars a barrel, and um, and these, the inflation numbers are real. So what we're looking at is the higher inflation goes, the higher interest rates are going to rise. And when interest rates go up, 
this economy goes down. And not only does the economy go down, the markets are going to go way down because they've been artificially propped up. You know, name the country, negative zero interest rate policy. And they're going to have to raise them. Look what just happened in, um, we wrote about this in this week's Trends Journal, in Turkey. They, Erdogan, the president, fired the third central bankster in two months because the guy raised interest rates because inflation is going over 15%. So they're saying in the United States that, oh, this is only temporary. Oh, yeah? Okay, let's say it's temporary. What does it cost now just in lumber to build an average home in America? Oh, only $36,000 more just in lumber. Forget about all the other stuff, the copper, you know, everything else. All right, so the prices are going to come down. So suppose they come down 50%. They're still way up. So you look at the numbers and, for example, oh, they brag that, you know, in May, consumer spending went up. No, it didn't. Yeah, the spending did go up, but they didn't buy more product. It cost them more money to buy less. So that's the big news, is inflation. Because when it, as, and also, as currencies go down and inflation goes up, it costs you more to buy things. So the big news is inflation. And inflation, when it goes higher, interest rates are going to go higher. And when interest rates go higher, the economy is going to go lower and the equity markets are going to dive deeper. Is it time the government told us what the real rate of inflation is? Remember back in the 90s, Canada and the U.S. agreed that they would take fuel and housing out of the inflation index because they were too volatile. But I'm telling you, uh, so people, instead of getting uh, 15% pay raises to look after the high cost of things, you were getting 2%. And the same thing with Social Security. You know, and Social Security is based on the CPI, Consumer Price Index. They're lying, low-life pieces of scum crap, all right? You could thank Bill Clinton for this one. He's the one that started it. Oh, you know, meat prices aren't going up. If you were buying steak and now you're just buying hamburgers, that's fine, you know. We brought the price of steak down to a hamburger. This whole thing is rigged. For the real numbers, you want to go to uh, shadow stats, John Williams shadow stats. You're looking at inflation way over 20%, you know, in some of the, some of the calls. I don't know the real number, but it's way, way above what they're saying. And he mentioned housing prices. They've gone up, what, 14% in the United States year to date. And that's not included in the inflation index. You know, it's one after another. So th- th- this thing is going down big. And again, it's global. Now, the EU numbers came out a couple of days ago. It's, over, it's about 2% or over. And, and they made up this thing, by the way, that the 2% inflation rate is the inflation rate that the central banks look at before they raise interest rates. They made that number up in 2012. It means nothing. So they're going to have to raise interest rates at some point because this economy is really getting hot. It's really overheating. And... You're looking at housing prices going up the way they are and across the board and, and all this cheap money they're dumping into the system. So it, it, when inter- again, interest rates go up, the economy goes down. You're already seeing it with, uh, with uh, new mortgage applications. Even, even though they're going up just a little bit, they're slowing, they're slowing down week after week. You held a big freedom rally in Kingston, New York to make a big announcement. Can you tell us about that? Oh, yeah. You know, it, the weather was terrible. It was 50 degrees and, and on May 29th, and it rained up to about an hour before we had the event. It was scheduled to go on at 3. It was raining up until 2. And we still had, you know, almost 400 people, three, 400 people here. And the announcement is we're starting a church. And the name of the church is the Universal Church of Freedom, Peace, and Justice. And all religions are welcome if the God you believe in believes in freedom, peace, and justice. And we believe that the way that we can bring back our freedom, peace, and justice is definitely not through the political system. Going through the political system is going through murderers and thieves. How many wars do they love to kill people? And how much of our money they'd like to steal to give to the bigs and the banksters? 
So the political system's totally corrupt. So we're starting a church, a universal church, and we believe this is the way to change the system. As a matter of fact, freedom is the word. You know, they had a rally in London uh, last Saturday. They estimate a million people turned out. You know what they wrote in the toilet paper of record? They call themselves the paper of record, the New York Times. It's a piece of crap. It's only good for toilet paper. They also had the arrogance to have on the headline all the news that's fit to print. Oh, you're telling me what's fit to print? But anyway, you go to them and you go to NBC News. You know what they said? Hundreds, hundreds took to the streets in London. We put the video up on our uh, on the Trends Journal. Hundreds, hundreds of thousands. So what was the the rally? Freedom. Freedom not to get vaccinated if you don't want to. Freedom to go out and live and, and enjoy life. And that's what they're taking away from us. Look at oh, another story in the Trends Journal. All this thing, stay home, stay safe. Remember the imbecile morons, low-life piece of scum crap politicians that crap was shooting out of their mouth last year and still going on in other countries like Australia that's locking down again? Stay home, stay safe? Oh, According to the hard data, even the CDC had to admit it, your chances of getting the virus outside are the grand total of less than 1%. And then you got these little scum telling you to stay home and stay safe. What am I, six years old? Who are you talking to? Hey, I'm the principal of the school, and now I'm your mayor, and now I'm your governor, and now I'm your premier. Look at the crap heads you got in Canada. Look at the little jerks. Ford, Rankin, and that, that clown Strang over there, over there in Nova Scotia. What do you got, 74 people dead out of a population of over uh, almost a million over 17 months? And the average age, 80 years old? And you got these imbeciles closing down everything? Where are the people? Freedom, peace, and justice. How... Let this, any one of these clowns try to tell me what to do man to man. They're not men. They're arrogant little pathological liars scum. And they're destroying life on earth. And if we don't unite, it's going to be hell on earth. You know, these religions, they tell you, oh yeah, it could be hell on earth, but if you're a good boy or girl, you go to heaven? Yeah, I know. Yeah, great. Yeah, Mary was a virgin. Buddha was born on a lotus blossom. And Moses came down with Ten Commandments. Great. Good for you. But how about this? How about having heaven on earth? How about making this beautiful? And that's what this church is about. Does it look like the push for Agenda 2030, the Great Reset, is succeeding? Oh, definitely succeeding. Look, look at the, look what just happened in, in the States. One of these big companies that produce all the meat over here, beef and meat, you know, like over 20 something percent of it. They got hacked. Prices went up. You got a couple of big companies running everything around the world, and they're in charge. Competition's gone. Remember, they used to have things called hardware stores and stationery stores, and now you got Home Depot and Lowe's and Staples and Office Depot. All the little people out of business. No, it's to they're totally in control because the low life scum. And again, little, little, little. Look at the little nothing daddy's boy you got up there in Canada, Trudeau. True dope. He'd be nobody if daddy wasn't there before him telling you what to do. And they, and what they did is they did away with all the regulations, the antitrust laws that didn't permit the bigs to own everything. So it's definitely going on. I go into these stores, you know, I gotta go into an, a, a Lowe's. My heart breaks watching the people work in these places. I, I really, every time I go in there, my heart breaks. What, what, what kind of future do they have? What kind of future? Yeah, no future. Are people waking up to what's really been going on with the pandemic narrative? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we were the first magazine. The first magazine back in January of 2020 to say it was a fraud. Our headline was coronavirus, 106 dead in China. Next line, 1.4 billion still alive. What are you telling me? 106 people died out of 1.4 billion. Oh, only 1.6 million die air pollution there each year. That's why they wear the masks. And whoever would have thought people would have been that stupid to do that. I estimate between 35 to 40% of the people are totally against us. 
And it does not take a majority to prevail, but rather an irate Tyler's minority, keen on setting brush fires of freedom in the minds of men, said Samuel Adams. And that's what we're looking at here. And that majority is ready to unite. And and they've had it. And again, they're fighting nobodies. Except you got the little cowardly COVID cops up there in Canada. What a bunch of disgusting little boys and girls. Over here in Kingston, New York, we have real men and women that are our police force, not these little clown boys and girls handing out these fines, what they did to that preacher over there in Calgary. Ah, disgusting, disgusting. Canada, communist Canada. Why are governments trying to bribe people to get the experimental injections, especially when it looks like vaccine-related deaths are climbing? Look who they are. Oh, oh, hey, how about the United States, that company Pfizer? What did they give Joe Biden? To, to to celebrate his inauguration? Oh, only a million bucks. Imbeciles and morons call it campaign contributions. Adults call it bribes and payoffs. Look at the little clown boy that was the head of the Food and Drug Administration in the United States. This guy, Scott Gottlieb. Got crap. Now he's on the board of directors of Pfizer. All right, grow up, everybody. It's not a revolving door. The criminals are in charge. Imbeciles and morons call them big pharma. How about calling them drug drug cartels? Call a spade a spade. Are people now being divided again this time, the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated? Oh, yeah. But the unvaccinated, the vaccinated are little cowards. You know, you don't have to worry about them. And uh, the unvaccinated, again... Look, 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 it's, again, it's never in the news. They opened up Texas. They opened up Florida. Remember when in Florida they had the, the spring break and oh, 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 the people are going to die. Nothing happened. Nothing. They had a big, big good thing over there in Spain, in, indoor. Nothing happened. Again, who's dying from this? We've been writing about it from the beginning. Elderly people. And other people with 2.6 pre-existing chronic conditions. Oh, and the flu evaporated this year. Nobody died of the flu. They only died of the virus. If you fell off a ladder and broke your neck and they tested you positive for the virus, you died of the virus. I'm not making that up. And they're doing that because the hospitals are getting more money every time they put somebody died from the virus. Do you think forensic audits will overturn the 2020 election, and what could that mean for the markets? I don't think it'll do it, no. Uh, and I don't. And by the way, I definitely believe the elections were, were stolen. Uh, I was doing the election returns on a, on a station all night long, and all of a sudden, you know, Trump is leading, Trump is leading, Trump is leading, and all of a sudden, you know, 140,000 votes for, for Biden. Straight up, not one for Trump. When they counted ballots, you know, what am I, again, what am I, six years old? Who are you talking to over here? So, no, I believe the thing was rigged, but I don't think it's going to, uh, you know, at this point, it's going to change much. Gold's been moving higher. What do you see ahead for gold? I still see gold hitting around over 2,000 to 2,100. And as inflation goes higher and when the markets crash and the uh, economies go down, it's going to skyrocket. And still, you know, if, if there wasn't, you know, people, sometimes call me a futurist. And I said, oh, nobody can predict the future. There, there are too many wild cards. Who would, have, who would have guessed 11 years ago there'd be a thing called cryptocurrencies? If money wasn't going into the cryptocurrencies, gold would be 3,000. Silver would be over, over 100 an ounce. And, until, and, and that market is going to keep going up until the governments close it down. So as long as the crypto market stays strong, you know, gold and silver are not going to go as high as they should. Silver also going up. What do you see ahead for that? No, silver well, over fifty dollars an ounce. Again, you need silver for from it's it's one of the best conductors of electricity, and you need it in all your 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 high tech. So it's going to keep going higher. Demand, supply and demand, and um, and again, yeah. Although young people put their money and others are putting it into cryptos, the real safe havens, as I see it. Are, are precious metals. And now we just heard, you know, uh, from Russia that they're, you know, dumping all the dollars, buying more gold. And that's going to continue, particularly in the Asian nations. 
Are supply shortages including food an opportunity for commodity markets to be manipulated? They're always manipulated. We just wrote a story in this week's Trends Journal of uh, manipulating of the markets, and they get a slap on their wrist. J.P. Morgan Chase rigged the uh, the precious metals market, and and they got fined in in um, I think it was twenty twenty or twenty nineteen. You know, the grand total of nine hundred million dollars after they rigged it that probably cost tens of billions of dollars. So well, it's a it's a rigged game. You know, it's there in front of everybody's eyes. In Canada, Prime Minister Trudeau has canceled federal elections until the pandemic is over. Is it time to bail out of Canada? It's, again, you know, who's this little clown to do that? Pandemic. What pandemic? You know, what pandemic? And that's not, it's an improper word to use. Again, you look at Canada, and, and you know, the last time I looked at the data, you had um, well over 40% of the people that died from the virus we're from nursing homes, and the average age is, is, is in the late 70s, 70 to 80 years old. So why would you, why would you close down an, a, 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 uh, an economy for that? Uh, what do you have? You have 35 million people in Canada, 35 million, and you got 25,000 deaths in 17 months? I mean, I'm not good at math, but you know, you could go shove it, one of you politicians out there, when you call this a pandemic and we got to close down things, when you look at who's dying and why, and the numbers are there, you're looking at an 80-year 80, 80 death age. And again, at least 40% from nursing homes. And you're closing down the place? What do you see ahead for the Middle East and crude prices? Crude's going to keep going up, and they're going to keep doing more against Iran, particularly Israel. I mean, where they sunk one of their biggest, one of their biggest ships sunk a couple of days ago, the Iranian ship, the biggest one they have. And, uh, you know, they don't know who did it. And so, uh, oil prices are going to stay high. We don't see them going down. We see them going much higher from here. When oil prices hit $100 a barrel, this thing is over, man. You're going to see inflation skyrocket and this thing go down hard and fast. Should people use cash instead of allowing a cashless society to be ushered in? Well, they're going to do a cashless society whether you want to do it or not. And China's leading the, the charge in that. They're going cashless, so they know every penny you spent, where you spent it, how you spent it, so they can get their percentage of it. And simple as that. And uh, the world is going from digital dirty cash, though we call it from, <laughs> I've been joking about it, to digital trash. And it's, uh, it's a reality. And again, that's very important because when the world goes digital, cryptocurrencies are going to go nowhere because they're not going to allow competition. So now they know every penny you spent, where you spent it, how you spent it, what you spent it on, and so they could get their taxes because they don't work, them and the bureaucrats, and they want to get the money from you. So that's what they're going to do, and they're going digital. Is the U.S. in another real estate bubble? Not yet. Um, it, 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 the prices are going to stay well where they, where they uh, spiked in exurban and some suburban areas because you're going to see a re, uh, commercial real estate dive in the cities as less people are going to go back to work. Even if, you know, 80% of the people go back and commute, you lost 20%. That's going to hit it hard. And the commercial sectors were overbuilt before. So commercial real estate is going to take a hard hit. Five Oregon counties voted to secede and join Idaho. Is this just the beginning of the remapping of America? Uh, well, you know, yes and no. It depends on the movements, and they're, they're going to fight it, you know, the, the, the states. But there's going to be more and more of, of splitting away from the federal government uh, from many states. So I would say more statewide than, than region-wide. And it was happening, by the way, in the, in the 2000s, early 2000s. Uh, Thomas Naylor, may rest in peace, was heading the Vermont Republic, Second Vermont Republic. And it was getting very close to things happening there. And so I think it is going to be a point when the federal government takes more and more control over the people, there's going to be more and more fighting back against it. Uh, a poll I saw a few years ago said something like 38% of Texans would love to be an independent country again. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's what I was saying. It's yeah. going to be statewide rather than, and rather than, you know, little breakouts like the one over there uh, you were talking about. So yeah, no, it's going to happen more. Uh, as the government, as the federal government tries to take more control, there's going to be more and more states trying to break away, and, and they're going to in, in, in many different ways. 
China, Fauci, Wuhan, your thoughts? Yeah, I don't believe one thing that little lying, and I call him a little liar because he is. You go back to uh, March of uh, 2020, and he's telling people that the masks are useless and not to wear them, and then he tells them to wear them. One after another, he keeps on lying. And he's the highest paid uh, public person in the United States. Could you imagine that little clown getting almost a half a million dollars a year? So, yeah, I, 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 he's a liar. I, and I, I don't believe a thing he says. By the deeds you shall know him. And so uh, I think this can be very well a manufactured. We have a huge story in the Trends Journal on it by Gary Null, if you want to know more of the details. Now, uh, one of the things they're talking about with the uh, virus is that it was developed in that lab in Wuhan and deliberately released. And I'm thinking it was the perfect solution to the riots that were happening in China due to bad air quality, the riots in Hong Kong, a virus that will kill some people, but you better stay home because you're all at risk. What better way to stop public unrest? Well, that's what we wrote about when it happened. It's exactly what we said uh, oh, 16 months ago, that they were using it to close down the... I was on Hong Kong TV uh, continually throughout 2019 when the protests were going on. And I talked to the reporters off the air, and they said, we're not fighting, we're going to keep fighting this. We don't want the Chinese to take control. And uh, it's over. And they, they used it when they shut down Yuan, they closed down Hong Kong. Then they passed a security law, and that was the end of it. And that's what we said was happening. And that's exactly what, why they did it. Gerald, you were dead on when you predicted Russia would invade the Crimea. Uh, what other trends are you keeping a close eye on right now that other people aren't? Well, I didn't say they'd invade the Crimea. Well, they never invaded it. They were yeah. there. Okay. What we said was that they were going to annex it, and the people were going to vote, and then they were going to win, and they didn't want any part of being a part of the Ukraine. And the, the next, the things to look at are the Middle East and Africa. Africa is in total turmoil. Uh, what's going on in Ethiopia, Sudan, South Africa is locked down again. And again, ridiculously, you know, and, and, and they're, they've been in, they had one, they, they've been in terrible, terrible economic shape before this happened. Uh, disturb, disturbances uh, throughout Latin America as the, uh, economies crashed. If people think there's immigration problems now, they haven't seen anything yet. So it's very, very important to take a global view. Angola, what's going on in, uh, excuse me, Algeria. Oh, yeah, and in Angola, Mali. Uh, the, the destabilization is, is, is unbelievable. And it, it's going to have an effect. So I, I really suggest people stay in tune to that. Because then you're going to start seeing a lot. You know, by the way, this thing they call rare earth minerals, they're not rare. Uh, they're rare because they're not being mined, and it takes a lot of years to mine them. So that would also make them rare. So you got to look at those kind of prices too. And now China's in control of those. So th those are the things really to look at. And where where the yuan is going, the Chinese currency, that's another big one to watch. We, we're forecasting that uh, in the next several years, the dollar is going to decline dramatically, and China by the uh, middle of this century is going to be the, um, the the top reserve currency in the world. They're all, they're going to outpace the United States as the largest economy just within several years. Is there anything the U.S. can do about that? No, and not not with the morons and imbeciles running the show. They sold the country out. Made in USA? No. Made in China? Made in Vietnam? Remember, we have. I, I grew up during I was you know prime draft age in the Vietnam War, how we were taught to hate those commies, and now we're doing more business with Vietnam than just about any other country, and China, and those Chinese, right, commies. No, yeah, it's not going to... You're looking at J.P. Morgan Chase, BlackRock, uh, they're going all, all, into, all into China. And so, uh, no, China, China's it. If we had a real uh, American president and a, a real political system, it would be a self-sustaining economy. They're too ignorant, and they're too bored off, and they're too uh, cowardly, and there are too many pathological liars running the show for that to happen. How can people learn it more about the Church of Freedom, Peace, and Justice? Well, we're going to be publicizing it more. We just announced it and putting it together, and we're going to be putting up a, uh, a website. The website's going to be freedompeacejustice.church, and that should be coming up within weeks. How can people sign up for the Trends Journal? 
No, simply by going to trendsjournal.com, trendsjournal.com. There's no magazine, and I'm not saying it because it's mine. I'm saying it because there's no magazine comes close to it in the world. Nothing, 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 nothing. And uh, it really tells people what's going on, what's next, and, and how to prepare for the future. Gerald, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. And thank you. Take care. All right, bye-bye now. I've been speaking with Gerald Salente, publisher of the Trends Journal, available online at trendsjournal.com. He was speaking to us from historic Kingston, New York. And that wraps up This Week in Money. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Victor Adair, and Gerald Salente. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for the show, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Now stand by for a company showcase update from American Manganese CEO and President Larry Ray. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. Welcome back to the show, Larry. Thanks, Jim. Larry, you had some great news to release on June 1st. What was it? Well, it was to do with some uh, more uh, precursor development and production and uh, that meets the standards of the uh, battery manufacturers. And uh, we've got some pictures in there that shows the morphology of, uh, of what we expect to get and the final results. And uh, not that we expect, we've seen, but, uh, you know, in the final results, we don't have a c- c- conclusive uh result as of yet, but uh, that's what it's going to look like. And uh, it's getting to uh, be more and more important that uh, companies are, uh, you know, going to be compatible with these gigafactories, because that's where all of the uh, waste production is going to come from. When a gigafactory starts up, they can have up to 30% waste, but we'll uh, we'll work with a 10% number, which seems to be the industry standard. And uh, we'd like to turn that around and uh, they could put it back into their battery manufacturing rather than send it out for chemical treatment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that's going to be more and more the uh, business plan of gigafactories going going forward. And uh, so, you know, we'd like to be uh, in line to be able to perform those services. And uh, you know, that puts us uh, at the top of the heap but it's not like it's a uh, you know it's a one shot deal it's uh, 10% is every day and uh, you know so it's a steady supply and uh, the other things you have to think about is the uh, how you're going to uh, integrate that into a uh, gigafactory and uh, you know currently we're uh, uh, the design of the Itilvolt is uh, including us in the design for a uh, recycling plant. So uh, we're feeling pretty good about that. You know, we've been getting calls lately. Uh, more and more people are interested in what we're doing. It seems like uh, finally the, uh, the coin has dropped and uh, people begin to realize that maybe, maybe we're not full of shit. And... Uh, you know, let's uh, put it this way. Uh, you know, we've got uh, results that are third-party validated by Cometco, which, in my opinion, is a top research lab in the world, and uh, specifically when it comes to uh, recycling and batteries. And, uh, you know, we were very lucky to get involved with them 12 years ago, and uh, we've been uh, working with them pretty pretty much uh, steadily, except for a lapse of about three years, uh, you know, on our uh, manganese project and our uh, now our recycling project. And uh, you know, it's uh, they've got the know-how, we've got the staff and the uh, expertise within this uh, office. There's five of us here, and. Uh, 
we uh, all have certain duties to perform, and everybody's an expert in every field that they do. Zarco does an excellent job of presenting the uh, process and talking about it. He was, uh, I think he did about three or four presentations in the last week. And, uh, you know, so, and that gets around, and uh, so we get we get calls on that from uh, other, from gigafactories, for example, or people that are looking to move into the field. Uh, there's a lot of companies that are uh, looking at expanding into the recycling field, and uh, that are either involved in commodities one way or another, or they uh, are involved in the battery industry. So, you know, it's uh, it's become an open book for us and uh, you know, we just got to keep filling the uh filling the spaces, uh putting out uh, transparency so that uh we can rebuttal anything that's uh is said against us and believe me, there's a lot of it out there. And uh we uh we just got to keep our head down, ass up and uh you know, keep doing what we do best and that is uh uh Developing a process along with Cometco, and uh, that will, uh, you know, answer a lot of questions when it comes to uh, sustainability, it comes to saving the environment, it comes to, uh, you know, keeping any deteriorous materials out of the environment. So, uh, yeah, we uh, we're pretty happy with the results. We had a nice run up in a few days here. The last couple of days, we've been pushed down hard. And uh, I'm not going to go into that because I am tired of talking about that type of trading that goes on. Um, most people are aware of it, know that it happens, and uh, but the, I get a lot of pushback from uh, guys that are actually shorting the stock and filling their pockets and eating your lunch and uh, trying to make uh, the company look bad. So uh, anyway, we're we're happy with what we're doing. We can back up anything that we say. And uh, you can go to our financials and see where we spend our money. And uh, in a lot of cases, you can't do that. So uh, it's, uh, you know, you, if you can't uh, find out where you've been doing R&D and everything, like that's not something that's going to happen overnight. We talk to companies that have been working on recycling for years. And, uh, and you know, they agree that uh, we are probably the most advanced process out there. And the best, and uh, you know that's all I can say about that. We have NDAs with those companies, and uh, it certainly uh, looks like uh, you know, we're starting to get to the top of the heap. And the top of the heap means uh, all kinds of good things for the shareholders and uh, for the management in here. And before I carry on with that, I do want to remind everybody that there's an AGM that's uh, going to be had on uh, held on. Uh, on uh, June the 9th at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And if you want, you can vote your shares. And uh, if you don't want to vote your shares, well, don't vote your shares. But uh, it's the only chance you get to uh, to actually uh, decide on who's the management of this company. And uh, and you can go on from there. Now... I think that the uh, that the uh, staff and directors have done a tremendous job on um, bringing the company this far. Um, you know, we've uh, we've attracted all kinds of attention, and uh, you know, I think it's uh, not that far away that somebody's going to offer us uh, well a decent pile of money, and uh, we can proceed on uh, you know building the building out the design and the. Uh, Estimations, and I've got to caution everybody that well, you heard Elon Musk saying that the cost of materials are going up, and that's the truth. It's not the worst part of it. It's the worst part of it is it becomes a long lead item, and uh, you know, so you're just there's always going to be things that are going to hold you up that are beyond your control, and uh, recycling is going to become a big part of the equation when it comes to supplying. Uh, Especially to uh, landlocked, and I'm not just saying landlocked because uh, um, you know it's uh, in a certain area. Companies that uh, countries like the U.S. and Canada that have no real production of lithium and uh, cobalt and uh, specifically manganese, uh, you know, we've uh, we've got to 
depend on imports. And you, you can remember, oh, I don't remember, I'm not that old. But uh, it's uh, back in the First and Second World War that there were uh, blockades put up to uh, prevent uh, shipments of uh, metals that were required in wartime, and manganese was one of them. And uh, you know, ships were sunk, and uh, the uh, and that could happen again, especially now tensions are high around the world. So you've got to, uh, you know, we we think we're in the right place at the right time. We think that uh, gold is going to come front and center. Dr. Copper is already moving front and center. And uh, we have our fingers deep into those pies. And uh, manganese now, uh, I read an article where it jumped uh, 56% for electrolytic manganese metal, and that's really important to us because it was the price of the electrolytic manganese metal that is controlled by China that uh, sunk our uh, pre-feasibility study back in 2012. And, uh, you know, we spent a lot of money on, uh, on drilling and developing resources and uh, the testing. And, uh, and you got to remember that was the first uh, R&D work that was done and uh, that Comexco came through with the process uh, for us and it later developed into our uh, recycling process uh, with a lot, of, uh, a lot of different changes and tweaks and everything else. It just wasn't as straight across. But... Uh, and, or else we would have had that all contro- under control a couple of years ago. But, uh, no, it's, uh, it's been an exciting time in here. And, uh, I just want to thank our, uh, investors and shareholders, uh, for uh, sticking by the company and making sure that it's achieved its goals. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, everybody deserves a great weekend. Larry, for people new to American Manganese, what's the company all about? American Manganese is a critical metals company that developed the process for treatments of very low grades of manganese in the U.S. And uh, we are currently uh, treating uh, one of the, uh, or, or the Wendon stockpile, um, to develop a, uh, a flow sheet for electrolytic manganese metal. And uh, the grades that uh, came off the mines were 2 to 3%. Uh, they were... They were uh, mechanically increased to around 20, and uh, then, uh, you know, which is still an extremely low grade. And uh, now we are developing a process with the uh, DLA in the U.S. They're they're paying for us to do this, and uh, so we got uh, you know not just the recycling going on. We've got the uh, uh, manganese picture going on. Now the manganese price could, you know, stabilize and go higher. And uh, But again, that's controlled by China, so uh, I won't make any predictions there. I've dealt with uh, the backlash from China for many years, and uh, it uh, is not something that you can predict. And, uh, you know, but if shortages come about, uh, you know, China's going to look after themselves first, and then uh, the rest of the world can go look after themselves. So, uh we better be prepared to look after ourselves and uh, go on from there. Now, you can get all the information you want. Uh, we've got uh, hundreds of press releases out in the last few years on our uh, on our process and the advancement of that process and the breakthroughs and the patents and on and on and on. And uh, so, you know, it's not like we're... Uh, novices in this game, uh, you know, a lot of us uh, in this company have experience in uh, metallurgy and experience in uh, in working with uh, uh, metal prices over the years, and I don't see any risk in the metal prices, uh, but I do see that uh, we could become a major supplier of uh, certain elements like, uh, well, in the U.S., uh, for example, cobalt, lithium, nickel, and uh, manganese. So uh, that's a great future for us. You can go to that site at uh, AmericanManganeseInc.com. You can uh, phone the company at 778-574-4444. You can email me at L-R-E-A-U-G-H at A-M-Y-M-N.com. Larry, thank you so much for the update. You're welcome. We've been speaking with Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on June 4th. 
Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.